Welcome, everybody, to um, this uh, segment of Natural Pigments. We're interviewing uh, the artist uh, Teresa Oaxaca. And uh, Teresa is a realist painter and who um, uh, went to a number of schools in Italy where she got a good firm um, grounding in skills in uh, realist painting there. And of course, I'll let her talk about what she's doing. Um, and the um, uh, and how our relationship with, uh, with Teresa over the years. Um, we met Teresa, uh, natural pigments, uh, Tatiana uh, Zaitseva and, and myself met her at a portrait uh, society uh, conference uh, in uh, 2012. And, um, and ever since then, uh, we've not only, uh, she's been a, a good customer of ours, but not only that, she uh, a very good friend of ours too. So uh, I wanna welcome Teresa. And um, Teresa, when, when, uh, I know when we first met, um, of course you were using you know, paints from uh, quite a number of different, uh, I'm, I actually don't know which, which uh, other brands you were using, but you were using uh, different brands of paints before you met with us. And then um, we, you tried some of our, our products, our paints and, uh, in particular. Um, what did you find uh, about that that uh, was uh, of interest? Oh, um, or maybe different from other other types of paints. The first product I remember using was the oleo gel, and that was really nice. I was getting some really nice transparent passages and edge effects. And I remember that the John Singer Sargent and, and, and Zorn were very big at the time at those conferences, and I was trying to figure out how to get these really soft effects, and, and the oleo gel was helping with that. And I used the raw umber and it had this kind of granular quality and you could almost hear the coarseness under the brush while you're painting and that was something I wasn't used to and then of course uh, making that transition to lead white from titanium was uh, really really long due because a lot of the paintings that I had been studying in, in Europe were made with lead white as, as paintings were for for many hundreds of years and we were trying to imitate glazing passages and textural passages with titanium and also with a lot of um, so-called earth colors, but they were really organic. So you'd buy a raw umber and it'd be a mix of like four organic pigments to imitate raw umber. And so it would have very slow drying properties. It would sink in and uh, it just wouldn't behave at all the way it was supposed to. And, and um, I didn't really know better. So I remember you visited my studio with Tanya one time and I just my eyes were open because you were pointing out pigment numbers on the backs of my tubes you know I had these big bulk savings tubes uh you know like oh it's a sale let's buy the 150 millimeter tubes you know and, I, and so uh I was just like what no, this isn't this isn't Venetian red this isn't raw umber this isn't lead white you know because the tubes would say lead white on them but it would say like replacement and I just I don't know how to explain it but you know I I had read so much about history and um, aesthetics and stuff, composition, color, but I just hadn't really looked into materials. So uh, that was a big gap in my my sort of like out overview of, of my craft. So I have to thank you for pointing those things out and then making Well, it's it great, yeah. And, um, and I know over the years then you started to, um, uh, after you started exploring the differences in some of the paints, um, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> so you started exploring some of the differences in paints and um, uh, and and some of the mediums. Um, what you know in how did that change, or did it change? How did it change your work uh, overall? May, and it, maybe this is a good a good point. We can show some of uh, you made a little bit of a video mm -hmm. uh, of some of your work, so people can see some of the work, and then. Uh, let's just show some of that and, and we can, you know, talk, uh, talk over, uh, and you can explain some of that as, as we go. Sure. Yeah. Colors, as you can see here, um, on the left, there's a really bright patch of cobalt blue and, and the yellows are just really saturated and I'm just using historic colors. I'm using earth colors and, and Naples yellows. There's no cadmiums in there at all. 
And uh, I, I think it has to do with, with what you were calling the refractive index of pigments. Um, mm -hmm. so, so even though I toned down the palette and, and I got rid of most of the organic pigments, um, the, the inorganic ones just had a lot more like larger particle sizes in general, and it made me paint thicker. And that created a, uh, an effect when you saw things in person that the paint just looked a lot more robust and, and vibrant. And um, this painting here, for example, is, is, is made with, um, with titanium and, and some of the older colors. And this one here is, is one of the more current ones. So you can kind of see a difference, even though the current one's not done yet, but it's already looking a little more punchy. Um, yeah, so, so the, the body of the paint and up close, I, I think I get a lot more of those kind of delicious, like creamy oil paint textures. Um, and, and I feel like I have a lot more control. I, I also stopped using turpentine as a kind of a medium or a, I guess a dispersant to make the paint flow. So I, I have to use thicker hog hair bristles and, and it is like almost a different way of painting as well. But I still layer two to three layers, just like I did in the old days. And I, you know, keep most of my color mixing and, and other approaches the same. It's just that the look of the paintings and, and the handling is, is, is much different. Oh, look, and here you're, you're adding some uh, imitation gold leaf to uh, frame. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I do the pure gold leaf, but, but on this one, I just like the color of, of this metal leaf and it, it was a thicker sheet. So I, I went with it. And of course, Teresa is decorating her own frames. They're re remarkable work on that. So really like yeah, that. You can see when I'm turning in the video, the way the gold picks up a sheen, um, unlike, unlike the way the paint does, which I just think is really interesting to incorporate into, you know, works of art that are meant to be seen in person. I think that's one of the things that is important, you know, so that's why I like the natural pigments because in person you get um, a really interesting textural look. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like the gold leaf effect. It's just, it, there's more to offer than just the way it looks in a photograph on a screen. Some, uh, some of the colors you're using too, uh, you're using some of these, uh, older, old, you know, what some people call the old master colors. Um, how, how has that been in terms of your experience with I know you're using uh, lead tin yellow. I'm not sure if you're using that in this particular portrait. I do. I use lead tin yellow light and lead tin yellow dark, and and I use them a lot for things like 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 in the skin, on lights, and and the hair, and clouds, the sand, like anything that when I want a warm white, I use it. Um, it also just has really great handling and blending properties, and so I find myself not needing to add blending mediums into the paint because uh, a lot of colors that have uh, lead in them, I find they just blend and layer really well. So I don't need to add mediums. So I actually add quite few mediums to my paint these days. I used to have a very complicated medium regime and, and now it's very simple. And it, and it is almost just pure, uh, in most cases, linseed oil or walnut oil and, and paint. And, and I almost don't need to add the bodied oils either with a lot of these colors because they're already just perfect handling and so, so some of them are old master colors. Like there's a French Sienna, there's a Cypress Umber Raw Dark, which is like almost black. And uh, there's another one called Blue Ridge Umber and they're almost the same for me. So they're, they're really wonderful. Um, and then I have some colors that actually aren't historical, but, but could look that way. So I have a co Cobalt Chromite Blue and, and a lot of Cobalt Greens and, and Blues and Purples. And so those are, uh, just, just also they have this fantastic handling properties and they're, uh, you know, inorganic. So, you know, they're, they're probably a little more permanent as well. Um, so I just really like this, this kind of right. palette got together over time. And I've been replacing colors that maybe didn't work with me as well because they took too long to dry or they sunk in um, or they just were a, a bear to fight with and try to get to work. Um, you know, because you can see I do a lot of blending and a lot of fine detail. So when you when you do that, you you do have much higher expectations of your paint. Um, it's 
I, I tried alla prima, you know, and I can do it, but but I definitely, as you can see, like I, I manipulate the paint to a very small level. And so it's very important that the colors work well together with me. Yeah, and the um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned that's quite interesting is that you've, you've basically eliminated solvents in your painting. You're, you mentioned that earlier. You were using turpentine before. And um, how did you find that transition? Because we've been encouraging artists to paint solvent less. Yeah. Mostly for health reasons, but there's also good reasons uh, in terms of the overall integrity of the paint film. Yeah, I think you mentioned that a lot of the old masters didn't use solvents. Is that correct? Because it was very expensive. Yeah, it's, it, when you look at, uh, I mean, th there is evidence that they had solvents available, but whether they use them a lot is really, um, we don't know precisely, but because solvents like turpentine was available, it, it costs so much, not like today. And of course they didn't have odorless mineral spirits or even uh, mineral spirits. So uh, it's unlikely they would have used a lot of it. Yeah, they didn't have a vat, uh, like a liter of it sitting on their, their palette top and they weren't right. diving the brush in it every other stroke to change the color and, and to get the paint to flow, which is what I had um, in, in some places been taught to do, or I had seen artists do it and they made amazing work. And so I would, you know, would copy that. And uh, going from that to just using pure paint was difficult transition at first because all of a sudden the paint, you know, because it's oil um, paint and it's not watercolor, it doesn't flow like watercolor. And so you have to use thicker brushes really stiff ones. I started transitioning to round brushes as opposed to uh, short brights because uh, long, especially like Egbert's, they were just really good at still being flexible, but also pushing the paint around uh, just because of their length and, and the nature of the, usually it's a chunking hog hair. That's kind of like a tough, flexible hair. And so um, even the small brushes I'm using are, are made of that. And it, it, it once I used the correct brushes and and you know medium or pigment for the for the correct surface it's a little bit of a, a a triangle problem like you have to figure out the surface and then the appropriate medium and then the appropriate brush um, because if you use uh, the wrong brush you just like won't be able to move the paint at all and if you use uh, the wrong medium maybe you're taking the paint off the surface so you need to just figure out whatever that is and it's different for every substrate you work on and then once you have that it's, it's quite easy so so I, I adapted and it like I said I was very happy with the, the adaptation yeah and I also understood and, like getting headaches and migraines from having turpentine out yeah and, and that's that's I always just, a, that's always a good thing to not have to deal with that and you mentioned of course you're you're using uh, some mediums um, uh, you want to you want to elucidate on some of what you're doing with that and how you use them. So I used to use a palette cup and I had some mixture of uh, like linseed oil and turpentine. I, I stopped using the turpentine and then I would use a mixture of turpentine with, with sorry, a mixture of, of linseed oil with a little bit of bodied oil. And uh, now I've, I've stopped doing that and I just use the paste mediums that you make. So I use oleo gel, and then if I need a little bit of a bodied medium, I might use something like epoxide oil gel or Italian varnish gel and the impasto medium. So so between those, I have, you know, all the mediums I need. So I've, I've almost eliminated the drippy aspect of, of mediums. And so, um, yeah, I simplified things a lot more. So so now all the oils I have, it's, it's for making the paint. And, and that's that's part of getting ready to paint too, because if you can get your paint to the optimal consistency right in the tube, then you just squeeze it out and use it. And you don't need to spend like half an hour adding a bit of oil to one pigment or thinning another one out or thickening it up with chalk or whatever, you know, kinds of tricks you, you, you like to do. So that was a, a going on the search for like the perfect kind of uh, palette team of colors and, and, uh, making sure I had enough of those paints or pigments to last for a lot of works that that was kind of a, a task I set myself um, over a lot of years like it, it took me like 
seven years, you know, I wasn't just throwing on all new pigments in one day. Like I would try one color at a time and, and keep the rest of the palette the same. And then, you know, so here I've, I've added some cobalt turquoises. Mm -hmm. um, there's a dark one and then a lighter one. And that's something I never had on my palette before. And I really enjoy this now. So that's an example of like adding to the palette. It's, it's just sometimes I, I come up with colors that solve a lot of problems for me. So, so in, in painting, uh, cool colors are important to create transitions between light and dark and to get atmosphere and, and also they're just beautiful. So, you know, that was an example of, uh, you know, just adding another color gradually. Um, before that, I used a lot of Viridian to get my, my cool kind of green and blues. I still use Viridian. Now you, um, and I, some, some years ago, I remember, um, in fact, you wrote an article about low tint strength colors. And um, because we, uh, you know, some of the, some of the Rublev colors are lower tint strength. Some are mm -hmm. very low tint strength, almost, almost no tint strength. What, um, how did you come onto, you know, using those colors and, and how, how are, you know, how have they worked for you in, in your painting? Yeah, there's, I believe I came across them on your website because mm -hmm. you had a lot of pigments for sale that you weren't making into paints. And so I was continuing my exploration. I used to take tea breaks and then I'd, I'd read about a different pigment every day. And so, and, and it was, it, they were quite cheap to buy the pigments. I realized that like, oh, this is not expensive at all. So I would buy a lot of them and, and just when I had some free time, try them out. And it was the same thing. I'd come with a few that I thought were something I needed to use and others you know, less so perhaps, but it, it occurred to me that having a low tinting version of certain strong tinting colors could be useful for painting the figure. Um, and, I, and I mostly mean the nude figure because you have these large it's kind of swathes of skin that you need to gradually cool and darken. And if you're using really high tinting colors, it, it works. Usually you pre-mix a couple stages of, of uh, progression from light to dark. Um, but I thought, oh, you know, if I had had this when I was, you know, back when I was painting all these big nude figures, um, which, which I don't do as much. I do a lot of clothes people. Um, but it, that would have been useful because I could have just, you know, thrown big globs of these low tinting colors in, gotten the transition without overshooting the mark. It would have been almost impossible to overshoot the mark. You know, it's kind of a good analogy for people who use digital drawing tablets and programs. It's like the opacity on your brush is between like uh, five to 10, it won't go higher than 10. So a lot of digital artists use that when they're blending passages. It's, it's, it's kind of like that. It's, it's just kind of useful. Now here, you're, show, you're making uh, Minium which is that yes. red lead and um, um, what did, why did you decide to start making more of your colors? Cause you started off with some of those low tint strength colors I know. And, and then uh, gradually you, you uh, and, and by the way, Teresa took uh, at, at, I believe she took two of our uh, workshops and then the, what we did as a six day workout. And there we actually had artists making paint. And um, uh, so what, tell us what, you know, what's the, uh, what were you trying to achieve in making your own paint? Well, I think learning skills is really important. And so if, if you're going to be a full-time artist, you need to at least understand how the paint is made and, you know, I just, the more things you know, the better, you know, and you can always teach it. Um, if, you know, God forbid your favorite paint company stops making paint, you know, you're, you know, down the road, you know, you still know how to make it. Um, it, it, it just seems to be like, that's, that's how we still have the craft of painting because people were passing knowledge down. Right. It wasn't because it was in the hands of one person. It was because, um, you had master pupil, master pupil for, for thousands of years. Um, and so I think that that's just a, a no brainer that you would want to understand, you know, just because we're in the 21st century, doesn't mean that we don't need to understand things that were very basic knowledge to, you know, Tinderato, for example. And, and I also find it really fun to, to make paint 
and it doesn't take as long as people think if you're just making it for for yourself for example so i'm not out there every day i i might make paint outside once a month sometimes once every two months and, and if i go out i'll just make a few tubes and then i just have a rotation of, of colors that i use so the ones i make the most are the earth colors because i go through those the quickest mm -hmm. and colors like minium might only need to be made once a year and 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 you can just purchase them as well from 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 yourself you know it's not necessary to make them but maybe just for once i wanted to to try you know to have the experience and that kind of tactile quality of what happens if I use it with walnut oil? What happens if I do it with linseed? You know, that that's basically why. So you're, would you say that uh, with the Rublev colors, the, you, you kind of broaden your experience from, you know, the, all of the uh, standard colors that people use, you know, like all of the, well, and, and especially the organic colors, you know, they're very, they're very bright, very intense, and, and they're, they're wonderful colors. Um, but how would you how would you compare? Let's say you went from that to the Rublev colors, and now making your own. Mm, yep, it definitely gives you more of a feeling of control over your own craftsmanship. And there are a lot of colors that I couldn't find available in tubes on the market as well. And so I thought that you know that that was a little limiting to only use things that someone had kind of thoughtfully made for you. I mean, that it's, I use a lot of colors that people make for me, but I just thought that that shouldn't be a reason to not, you know, like if you really like cobalt chromite blue, you might like cobalt dark bottle green, you know, it just, mm -hmm. and I did. So I found a really nice, beautiful dark green. So I just, I wasn't just randomly buying things like a crazy person, you know, I'd research I'd sort of look at the, the chemical properties and, you know, uh, maybe ask you about it. I remember I was always asking you about things. And, and so, so I, um, I was just trying to like hone the palette to have, you know, the perfect, um, palette basically. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was studying in Florence and I was supposed to be learning old master techniques, which, which I was, you know, we did learn paint making there a little bit, but, um, I just wanted to continue that knowledge. And so perhaps having that background made me even more interested in this because I felt like I hadn't quite got there to understanding the paint and, and I wanted to, so. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find that very, so you, you, you find that very important as a, do you think it, it gives you an edge or perhaps a, a better ability in paint manipulation and and in, in your art overall? Mm, I I just know, and it, it might be a, something to do with, you know, age or just having gone through school and, and been on my own for a while in my studio practice. But yeah, I'm, I'm no longer always searching. I'm not looking at what someone else is doing and thinking, oh, I need to change this now. You know, I'm, I'm much more secure in what I'm doing and I'm happy with it. And so I can just focus on the creative side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's there's no more. Oh, this this color is sinking in. I can't continue to paint on this. I'm going to have to get a sponge full of oil and oil the whole thing out. Or I need to start again because the paint's beating up. Or I need to call someone and figure out what to do. There was none of these things. It's just the paint. It, I make it. It acts predict predictably. And the, the unpredictable part is, is what I bring to the studio with my ideas and my creativity. So that's kind of where it should be, I think. Yeah. So yeah. it's almost about an end to experimenting. It, it's, uh, it's, it's like letting yourself free to experiment with creative things and, and not to be hung up on materials um, all the time. Right. And, and um, with, we find, of course, a lot of artists are, are stymied because they lack those kinds of skills that 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 you've picked up over over the over the years and as well in not only uh, of course from the painting best practices workshops that natural pigments uh, conducts um, but also in the materials that you're using and um, so that's um, you know we find that too we find that a lot of artists are, are just 
they get stuck with what they're doing. And you mentioned, you know, you run, you, you know, do you think that you've um, uh, you've reduced some of the problems you've encountered prior, let's say, you know, that you were experiencing before you'd run into, let's say, like, like sinking in, you mentioned that? Yeah, I don't get sinking in. Um, my paints dry in, they start setting up in a few hours, but they're mm -hmm. dry in a few days. So I'm not waiting two weeks for something to dry because um, I've eliminated problem color mixtures, mm -hmm. you know. And when I say color mixtures, I'm, I'm probably referring to like, you know, tubes of paint that have four different pigments in them with a questionable oil and who knows what kind of additives. And so it's just not drying for ever, you know, that, that happens to a lot of people or they just buy a new medium in an art store because they want to experiment and then their paint doesn't dry forever um, or it runs or it flakes off. I don't know, there's all these problems and, and, you, and it's, um, yeah, that those are gone. And, and so I have an infinite amount of creativity and I'm just dealing with texture and color and, and sensation. And, and, you know, I have a huge amount of pigments behind me. So it's not like I'm saying you can only use these four colors, you know, like I, I'm not trying to like limit myself that way. I just, I just like to, uh, yeah, I feel like a professional artist and a professional craftsman. And I'm, I still want to learn more. Like I want to learn more about preparing panels and, and I want to get better at water gilding. Um, maybe, you know, try some kinds of uh, triptychs. I know we were, I was asking questions about making, uh, you know, paintings on panel on a triptych. So I have, I still want to learn more things, but, but I feel like, uh, I feel like artists should know about paint if they're calling themselves an oil painter, that, that, especially if they're teaching too, you know, they should know enough to teach a class and, and answer questions. And if they can't answer the questions, they should have someone like you that they can ask the harder questions and then they can go back and, okay, I heard this, you know, like, I, I just think there should be some kind of chain of information and, and, uh, it's, there's a lot to do as an artist. So, so why make things more complicated by not understanding your own studio practice? Sure. You know, what, have... uh, of the colors, like, you know, we talked a little bit about the old master colors, you, um, um, so-called old master colors like the lead tin yellow. Um, what what colors did you find? And these are unusual colors because they're not their historical colors, not readily available. What ones do you think you found the most interesting or perhaps surprising? Yeah, the the lead tin yellows. They they're very interesting because they most people look at color and it's it's kind of like the saying, "Don't judge a book by the cover." So they. You shouldn't judge a color just by Mine's the color gone. it is. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but yeah. um, it might have a stronger tinting strength. Or there are some colors like vermilion. When you mix it, you get more like purples, and in a cadmium, you get, might get browns. You know, and so they they have different tinting strengths. They have different handling qualities, different drying times, different reflective qualities. So you know, ultramarine, you can get these very beautiful jewel-like transparent passages. Um, cobalt blue is always going to be a kind of gummy, sticky, opaque blue. And it doesn't like to be mixed with other colors. It just goes by itself. So so I have a big collection of cobalt blues, like like maybe 10 of them now. And I do that because I'm, I'm almost like a Renaissance painter. It's just for this patch of sky here. It goes on pure. You know, it's expensive enough as it is. So why would I want to dilute it down. Mm -hmm. I, I can use a green for that. It's more versatile and, and, and far cheaper. And um, so, so that that's how I would think. So I'm not just thinking about the color of cobalt versus ultramarine, which is what you hear people say. They'll be like, well, this one's more red and this one's more green or this one's darker and this one's lighter. It's, it, I don't even think of that because I have cobalts that are super dark and I have ultramarines that are super light. So so knowing how to, how to you know, read batch numbers or pigment numbers and find the right ones and, and then you I, you know it's all it's all exciting you know there's just all these possibilities so so yeah it's, it's about the tinting strengths the handling quality drying time the way it looks in real life um does it feel like you can kind of see through the color or does it feel mm -hmm. like your eye just stops you know those that's are important things i think that artists deal with transparency and opacity a lot 
and having a palette that has a mix of transparent and opaque pigments is very very important for you know especially if you want to get those kind of like glowing old master passages you know that's that's uh, something to look into for sure and investigate so it's a juxtaposition of transparency and and uh, opacity and 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 of course tonal values that's that's also a very important part of that but we see a lot of your work in I see, you know, I see a lot of your the, your preparation work in in tonal values. You constant, you focus a lot on that initially, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that's part of the, I guess you could say the old master tradition of, mm. of getting space and atmosphere. And so there's a lot of work that goes into gradating tone, and then sometimes hue or temperature can be is is always used actually with it. So you know, each artist is unique in the way they turn form. Some of them go just with value. So they end up, I, I call it almost like a monochromatic kind of form. It doesn't change color too much, um, but it, it changes value expertly. Mm -hmm. Others fine and others shortcut and use color to, to turn. And so, and they might change depending on what passage or how much time they want to spend in the painting. And, where they are in their career. So, so there's all these little, little things that go in that people don't see. They're not painters and the colors help you achieve those different, you know, aims. Right. Yeah. So the and yellows have, they pack a lot of vibrancy is what I found. Um, so they might look like, I don't even really consider them yellows. You know, if someone shows up in class without a, a chrome or a cadmium yellow, I say, you do need one of those because these are more like off whites. They kind of have a, their own special, like just like the Naples yellows, they have their own special kind of uses, but, but I use them a lot. So I, I find them really, really helpful. And then the Minium is very unusual. Um, it's it's great for tinting things and you just add like a drop of it to white. You get this kind of light, like rose petal color, you know, you, you get these really interesting colors. Um, you can use it to tint all sorts of shadow, like like umber colors and bring the chroma up. I tend to do that a lot. I tend to work with earth colors and then I raise the chroma by increments with, with some of the brighter colors. And so Vinium's used a lot, even though it's not noticed. It's, it's rarely used pure unless I'm painting like a, a flower or something. And, sp and speaking about some of these colors, like do you find that let's say Organic colors, and when I'm and when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about, you know, the pyrrole, the quinacridones, uh, and you know, even uh, things like alizarin and so forth. Do you find that the the chroma is uh, compared to some of these inorganic pigments um, more, uh, I should say, maybe simple, or um, you know, there there's a it's a tighter chroma, so it's it's not as uh, not as complex. Kind of like wine, you know, wine becomes very complex. There's lots of under, you know, there's lots of uh, different aromas in it. Uh, what do you? That's a good analogy because you have your two bottle wines and your $50 bottle wines and you have to justify that. Well, it has all these complexities, you know, it's aged and it's from this field. Well, I, I, I do use a few of those, the pyrrole and quinacridone because you can't get that at all. Um, there's that kind of I find in painting, it's, it's hard to find that shade of magenta pink, like that kind of alizarin color. So right. I use a few of those because I do paint a lot of roses. Right. Cause they and, have a color space that's hard to find, but there's, you know, uh, there's, yeah, I've tried without them. It's, it's very difficult. You, you get nice colors, but you just get very opaque flowers and you need, I, I want the transparency. So yeah, I, I'll use them to glaze over. I'll do it kind of odd. I'll, I'll paint a rose um, opaque red or pink, maybe even the wrong color, and then I'll glaze, and the glaze will make it the right color. So the glaze sits on top, kind of like you were telling me about the, the girl with the red hat by Vermeer, you know, where he, he, he paints it indirectly. So I'll use them. So, so because of that, I almost never use them pure by themselves. So, so I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like it, it would be like painting with Iridian by itself or alizarin by itself. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like the color. It doesn't have enough body. It's it's a little transparent, which which yeah, which does bring me back to some of the earlier paintings I was doing. It, it it with a palette that was full of these very transparent but high 
high dyeing kind of organic pigments, it, it almost felt like being a printer because you were putting very high, high tinting, but thin passages over the whole painting and building it up slowly. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had a teacher, I, I brought work into um, at different drawing classes here in, in this area. And he said, you know, your drawing's very good. Your, your colors are good, but your paint's missing out on the buttery texture that oil painting really, because he was into, you know, Soroya and, and Velasquez. So he knew all about that. And so um, I thought about that for a while and, and I, I'm not blaming the paints, but I mean, I think I was just painting too thin, you know, but um, there is a difference between the way things look in print or on a photo and then in real life. And, there's, there's nothing wrong with making things just for um, publishing, you know, but but I think that if you want a painting that kind of holds its own in real life, you do need to put some effort into learning about materials and, and getting the body in there because otherwise you're going to end up with this thin kind of veneer of a painting. And, and I don't mean that, I mean, there are a lot of really nice paintings that are thin, and but they still have that body and presence to them, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a lot of northern um renaissance paintings and they were painting quite thin but they have presence you know like Bruegel or something or, or Bosch yeah. you know they have definitely presence um they don't look like a print when you see it yeah. so do, um we, we have a question there um and I know you briefly mentioned uh the mediums you use what what mediums uh are you using currently in your work yeah, I, I tend to squeeze the oleo gel out. Some of the pigments, they are a, a little stiff when they come out of the tube, so I might mix a tiny bit into the pile of paint at the beginning. And, and yellow ochre is a color like that. And so would be maybe French sienna or orange ochre. There's not that many of them. It's, it's mostly earth colors I, I do that with. And then uh, I would use rarely you know the italian varnish which isn't actually a varnish but maybe you should explain why it's called italian varnish because i i'm always forgetting that <laughs> so that's uh it's it's called italian varnish because in in that in a 19th century book by Merimi, who was a um, uh, who wrote a, a very important treatise in french and then later published translated into english uh he described uh different mediums that theoretically uh, the Italians used in previous centuries. And one of them was basically this, what he called Italian varnish. And so we recreated that particular formula. And, it, and it's actually, um, there's a lot, there, in the 19th century, there was a lot of bad mediums being introduced, um, actually even before that. But, um, but that was, we saw, I saw that one and I thought it, it's, it's a decent formula. It doesn't, doesn't have any resins, and so, um, and so it it it, you know, can function pretty well in in what it's what it's uh, intended to do. So, um, so that's that's why it was called Italian varnish. We just kept the same name. Yeah, and I should explain why I use this one. It it has bodied oil in it, right? It's, yes. Yeah. So 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 the oleo gel is like using linseed oil, right. and and so the Italian varnish is like using a bodied oil, and so. If, if you're making a painting that has more than one layer, the second coat, hopefully you have a pretty good block in down, but it's all dry. And so you need to be able to get your paint to adhere and not slide around like a, like an ice or something. It needs to grab on like a rock climber and just, you need to just work in small areas and your base, at least I'm speaking for myself, I'm mm-hmm. not obliterating the previous day's work, I'm, I'm building on it. So I mm-hmm. might be adding a transparent glaze or putting texture or just um, getting the gaze in a, in a portrait better, you know, I'm, I'm doing artistic things. And so I, I'm and I need a way to make the paint. And you can see it in that video, like I was working on a man's eye, that's like a second or third layer, you know, most of it's dry, and I'm just making touch ups, I need to be able to go in and make a touch up or an edit and, and it needs to look like it was all done and it's not a mistake. And so sure. that, that, that medium helps me get purchase with the brush on that layer and kind of seamlessly add my edit without anyone noticing that like, Oh, it doesn't match, you know, if that makes sense. So sure. it's, it's just a purely like functional thing. It's, 
and it's also great for blending, you know, so if you're working on an area with like a larger area and you need to do all this blending wet into wet and, and sometimes you get uh, the paint starts sliding around again, you know, and it might start coming off the, this, this medium will help it just it, basically the brush will um, encounter more friction. Mm -hmm. And so you can make blending edits and changes mm -hmm. instead of just like continually pushing things every which way and it's a mess. That's, that's basically all it is. Great. Okay. And, um, and of course we, I know that you are teaching, of course, with, with the pandemic that you, you did lots of workshops, uh, here in the United States and also in Europe and with the pandemic, of course, that kind of put that on a, on a hold. So, uh, maybe you could tell us about what you're doing now in, in teaching. Yeah, I've replicated the classes that I was known to teach and travel for. So I do them all on weekends. Because I think that's when most people are available and, and they're in person on Zoom. So I do live demonstrations. I also send students home with some pre recorded ones and, and we do live critiques. There's there's lectures which are more easy to do online actually with, with photos and things. Mm -hmm. And I critique kind of on an iPad uh, over your work without messing your work up in real life <laughs> and the, and I've been adding a couple new classes so I'm also teaching a paint making class a one day paint making class where it's actually more of just a watch you know I, I, I go through all the pigments I have how I make the paint how to go about finding it and all these different kinds of things um, and yeah and I, I sometimes add some some new classes like I just did one where I was teaching ink drawing uh, pen and ink and we were usually I was I was doing portraiture but I thought it would be fun to do really small things so we were doing insects like dragonflies and uh, frogs and uh, birds and things because I have some um, big big uh, zoom lenses so I've been taking my own photography out, outdoors and then I thought oh like this should be a class you know so I just I just add things so it's kind of fun um, I like the community and it's uh, it's very enjoyable for me to interact with people in person like that. Great. And where, where can people find out about your, uh, your, your classes and, and your work for that matter? So, so my website is www.teresawahaka.com and I have a page that announces online classes and they're all kind of on a rotational basis because they all fill up and they're popular. So I just put them, for example, there's a, there's a drawing, a portrait in charcoal in a week. And uh, I've already done that one twice, I think. So I just keep relisting it about every two months or three months. So there's about six on there. There's a, a life drawing group, which is virtual at the moment, but may go into real life because I used to run life drawing groups in, in Washington, D.C. And um, I've just started to announce in-person classes again as well. So I have a, a list um, and, and there's going to be two in Nashville in November and, and one in Mexico City in December. Hoping to add to that as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Teresa. And um, thank you for giving us your time here to talk about your work. And, and uh, I, you know, just looking at that pigment cabinet back there, it's, uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. Like you got a lot, of, a lot of different colors. And I mean, in the I should, video, should... you, had, you had what? What was that? Five kilograms of of uh, different yellows and yeah, yeah. I'm interested in um, enduring, you know, being an artist for a long time. So I like the idea of having a, a lifetime supply of colors so that they don't go, that they don't run out on me. And, and it's just really inspiring. I mean, I think that a lot of being an artist is about creating inspiration for, for yourself and others all the time. So, you know, it's, it's a hard world. So I think if you can create beauty and joy and inspiration and, and, and inspiration people can make their own beauty and joy it's the best thing so I, that's a lot of what this is about really it's just right. about excited to paint and make art and, you know enjoy it with others great thank you and on that note we are we finished our session and um, uh, please check out Teresa's uh, website TeresaOaxaca.com and I'm sure you enjoy a lot of her work thank you very much folks for uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you.